Hello, 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 everybody, and welcome to Roundtable Podcast Live for today, August 26, 2016. I am joined by my friends Ryan, Nick, and our guest this week, Malf. What's up, guys? How's it going? Welcome to Roundtable. I'm running it this week. Bear is off on a r- road trip, I guess. So if the stream crashes, we lose frames or whatever. It's to be expected at this point. Um, but yeah, welcome to Roundtable. And it, we're relatively on time. So I'm, I'm happy about that. Thanks for joining us, Malf. How's things, man? Hell, oh, you know, we, we be good. We be good. I'm looking forward to... To a weekend full of rim rolling and you know not much else. So you Bates haven't motel. changed. What no, no. no. Oh, you guys do. Shirt? Huh? Where'd you get that shirt? Uh, Europe. It's oh, Fred... okay. No, sorry, I asked. <laughs> it's it's Fred Perry, but I got it while I was in in uh, Amsterdam. Mm, okay, this is a nice shirt. Yeah, it's Amsterdam looks decent. good. Nice and they salmon prob- colored. They probably have uh, Fred Perry over in uh, Vancouver. That's good, so I know what to avoid oh! if I don't want to look like a dork. <laughs> <laughs> My mom thinks I'm cool. <laughs> God. Oh, well, before we uh, talk dis- uh, mouth any longer, to go about the topics real quick, since we don't have a proper docket in chat, because I don't, we don't have access to that. Hopefully that'll be fixed next time. The docket right now is to talk about Allison Road is officially back in development. No Man's Sky users go down 90% by week two. Steam Spy no longer taking dev requests. Dark Souls 3 DLC has been announced with the trailer. Endless Legend is getting an expansion. Nick finishes AM2R and Plus Plus and then wrapping it up with Deus Ex Mankind Divided. Mankind, Mankind Divided. That works. Which has been pretty fun. But um, let's just jump right into it with Allison Road. So Allison Road, if you don't know, for those who are not aware, was a PT-like, I guess, inspired horror game by a little studio that was eventually uh, kickstarted. Uh, and then they canceled the Kickstarter when Team 17 ended up picking them up to be their publishers. Um, in June, they tweeted that the game was being canceled with a relatively vague Facebook post about two or three weeks later saying it just wasn't meant to be. And now he's saying uh, he's going to continue developing it as a single developer, as one dude, and uh, no longer, I guess, attached to Team 17's uh, publishing name, which is strange, but I guess exciting because it looked promising. Um, What are your thoughts on it before I decide to dive into what I think about this whole situation? Take the floor, gents, whoever wants it. Well, a little bit of information to uh, inject into the conversation uh, that I recalled because I was a, a backer of This is the Police and I remember several months back that Team 17 was actually a uh, the publisher um, for the, what is it, Weepy Studios is the developer and they had a falling out, I guess. So, you know, maybe it's, I don't know if that's like something is wrong with Team 17 <laughs> and you know all these developers would want to get away from them or something like that but uh i think at least this is a place turned out relatively well for for what it was going for anyways it wasn't a catastrophe so maybe maybe that's a good sign for this but just you know i guess my, my fear about it is that i feel like if it's getting canceled it's getting canceled for a reason like there had to have been a reason that it wasn't going to continue on whether it be the gameplay wasn't up to snuff or it just wasn't going down the road that they would have liked. And it, it actually makes me feel, I guess, scared uh, that they brought it back. Like, I don't, I don't know. Like, usually games don't just get canceled for no reason. There's got to be a reason it was canned and uh, the, the publisher no longer wanted to work with them. So I'm curious. I, I, we'll never know, but I'm curious what that was and uh, if that bodes well or poorly for Allison Road. Was it actually canceled? Because the Facebook post that I see, unless Mm -hmm. the one that's actually relevant has been deleted, says, Hi all, after a long consideration between Team 17 and ourselves, we've reached a mutual agreement to end our collaboration on publishing Allison Road under Team 17's games label. Sometimes things pan out differently than expected as game development and publishing layers, or publishing have so many layers of complexity. We'd like to especially thank everyone for their support throughout. It has and will always be appreciated. And that, that, to me, doesn't sound like the game was ever canceled. Yeah. That sounds like Publisher the second breakup. post. Yeah. That sounds like the second post, though. Let me see if I can I just, find the old post. I just want to make sure it's not 
you know, like video game journalism telephone where like this is reported and then IGN goes, maybe this is canceled. And then websites pick up on that and go, Allison Road is canceled. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. All right. So that looks like the original post, but uh, no, because if you look at June 4th, their tweet, hi, all. Uh, sadly, Allison Road had to be canceled. Statement to okay, come in that's... the next few days. <laughs> Thanks for your support. And very sad it came to this. And then on June 15th, they made that Facebook post that you just read out. And now, now, like a few days ago, they have announced that, no, we're, we're, I'm working on it as a one-man project. Mm. So, it's not, it's not, uh, journalistic telephone, I guess. But I still, I still sit and wonder, like, there had to have been a reason it was canned or they decided not to work on it anymore. So I don't know. I wonder if they're going to kick up their Kickstarter again then. Because they never finished the Kickstarter. They closed the Kickstarter when they got their publisher. And they were getting like, I think they were closing in like 150 grand initially. Mm. I don't know, man. I, I wonder if that'd be a bad move though from, a, well, you know, the whole no bad publicity is still good or wh whatever. But, you know, that's kind of people getting an email saying, oh yeah, we're back open again. That might make some of the more unaware people kind of feeling unsettled that they've been so on and off with that. Well, that's how I feel. Like, I feel like, again, the, the tech demo, I guess they showed or proof of concept was gorgeous, but you can't really judge how the game's going to be on a, on a 10 minute thing because you can compact a pretty decently tense experience in 10 minutes. Now you got to take that experience and elongate over X number of hours. Maybe they just weren't able to do it or team 17 said that this is not panning out the way you know, we'd like it to, and they canned it, but he's going to continue on anyways. I don't know. It's weird. I just, I don't, I can't think of another indie game that's kind of done this on and off hot and cold dance with a publisher before and then decided to continue. I hear what you're saying about the momentum possibly being an issue. And especially if you consider on a larger sense, these games that are sort of these photorealistic horror games, all sort of having trouble around the same moment because of this perceived backlash that is this PT, is this not PT, and all of that business. Right. I understand that would probably create quite a bit of frustration amongst people who aren't sure whether or not they're, like, cursed, so to speak. Right. I know it's a little bit of a hyperbolic thing to say. I don't really think they're cursed. But it does seem like a lot of them have had troubles in development all of a sudden. And uh, I would love to see one of them get finished. Um, but I'd also love it if we could not label them all as PT likes either. But I've been down that road before. That's true. I, I mean, Allison Road... I think out of all of them became the most PT like because I think it was it was announced pretty shortly after the cancellation of PT and it really looked like PT in a lot of ways. Um, I would agree though, not everything that sh is first person horror adventure should be smacked as PT like, especially like the new Resident Evil. But people I really want PT. I might be one hundred and fifty thousand years old. You are, but I don't. I, I've reached a point where I don't care about games that don't exist yet. So it's like, yeah, this it's yeah. having problems in development, it's canceled, it's uncanceled. As far as I, that's two states that are exactly the same. It already doesn't exist <laughs> from my perspective. Mm. Its existence has not been brought into question by its, you know, progress in development. So it's one of those things where I'm like, like I, I'm looking back and I'm like, Two years ago, or a year and a half ago, when this was kickstarted, people must have been like really enamored with PT because they almost yeah. funded this for two hundred and fifty thousand pounds, which is yeah. a pretty ridiculous sum of money. Not necessarily from a game development standpoint, but to get that much money based on an idea and a short tech demo. So, I guess I find it. I kind of find myself being like, I. It should be a red flag from a consumer standpoint that That's development nice. is troubled. But instead, it's like a news story because people are excited about it. I just find it weird that people are like, I'm really rooting for this because I want it to be good. And I mean, I guess you should want everything to be good, but this is, I think it's a bad sign, probably. That's where I stand. I feel like it's a, it's a bad sign, but I, if they end up going the Kickstarter route, I wonder how much money they would get bringing up the point that this did come, I think, hot off the... The tales uh, of PT's kind of recent cancellation, so they kind of capitalized on that. I wonder if they would reach the same amount of money, or similar amount of money, if they mm. decided to kickstart again. It's a bit of a dichotomy then, so they're actually trying to capitalize off a thing they also want to separate themselves from at the same time. So that internal conflict probably couldn't read much good, I would think. Yeah, that's true. It's weird. It's just a weird story all all around. I, I'll be I'll be keeping an eye on it because I think the tech demo was promising, but a tech demo, like you said, doesn't really amount to anything other than 
this is what we kind of want to do and here's a very short 10 minute experience so. and I, I, actually i like something in chat everyone's saying uh everyone's pointing their fingers at team 17 but maybe the dude is a dick yeah i mean that's the oh, danger no, yeah. with it's the danger with like speculation is that maybe maybe team 17 is like you know hey can you send us what you got on the game so far and then it's like not even close to where it should be <laughs> from their perspective at this point like you never know on deadlines a deadline's not like being this. met yeah. this that and yeah. the other it it goes both ways you know developer not providing enough stuff or publisher trying to take too much control over the project or having unrealistic expectations things so i mean it's all speculation but yeah, I want to make that clear. I wasn't, like, shitting on Team 17. I was just saying that Team 17 canceling it, you know, publishers don't typically cancel things for poor reasons, or at least in their eyes, poor reasons. And uh, if they're canceling it, you, I, my worry is, well, why did they cancel it? There had to have been a reason. No, so. you weren't shitting on Team 17. Mike was shitting on Team 17. Way to I go, Mel. I wasn't necessarily <laughs> shitting on it. I was providing evidence of a relationship with another developer that team 17 i don't know why they severed um yeah. i think it was creative differences if i felt if i went back into the emails but i'm just saying by the happening here you know maybe team 17 they just they want to keep a you know certain type of game under their umbrella they don't want to just put games out there for the sake of it unless it's uh, worms unless it's yeah worms so um, I'm sure there's a good reason for it. You're not just gonna ru not ruin, but like sever a relationship just like that for for no real reason. So, right. Yeah. Well, we'll keep an eye on it and see what happens. Um, let's move on to the next one, which it'll probably be a short topic because I don't know what there is much to say, but it's worth mentioning. And let's not use all of our No Man's Sky fuel. I mean, we might want to talk about it next week. And, we uh, might. Maybe and the week, week after. after that and, and the uh, week after forever. that. So I saw a topic uh, that was on Reddit that was a little overblown. It was 80% sales dropped by 80% a week two for No Man's Sky. And what people don't realize is that when that happens to every big release, like week one is the most of the sales and then the drop off is like th within that percentage usually in week two. But the bigger story that came out that came out in like Destructoid and a couple other places is that the active player base, at least on the PC version from week one to week two dropped by 90%. So it went from a little over 200,000 people playing to about 20,000 people playing in the span of yeah. a week, which is more, I think, more of a telling thing than any than sales drop-off, because sales drop-off always happens. Yeah. So, um, hooray. <laughs> uh, <it's> well, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know if I'd say hooray. What I, I mean, that obviously sounds really bad, but what is the, what's the context for this? Like, what is a normal drop-off? for a there, game what, like especially a big game a week after it comes when out. i was reading through the reddit thread uh thread it can vary anywhere between like 60 to like 70 or 80 ish percent 90 okay. is a little bit bigger than normal um, so i just i i'm not operating under the assumption that no man's sky has not been very disappointing i just want to know if this is like uh is this like a Titanic situation where Titanic comes out and starts small and then every week it grows? Or is this like a Suicide Squad situation yeah. where everybody's like, I've got to see it Thursday at midnight or Friday or there's no point and then it drops off like 80%. Right. So I will say like for context, right now there's 15,000 people playing No Man's Sky on Steam. Rainbow Six Siege has 15,400. So wow. that gives you some context for the fact that it's like it's down there. Yeah. Yeah. Dead by Daylight has sixteen thousand two hundred. It's got a new killer though, so Yeah, and oh, Rainbow Six they've 30, had thousand they've had new operators and stuff to kind of keep it fresh. True, but that's like I, I would never have expected No Man's Sky to drop in concurrent players below Rainbow Six Siege. Or like yeah. Yeah. contemporary with Rainbow Six Siege. It went it's down so fast, yeah. And I think a lot of that, I mean, we've talked about it and we've, Nick, how much more have you played since uh, last week? Have you played any more? Yeah, I have like 20 hours in it now, I think. Have you beaten it? No. Well, you, know, you know what <laughs> yeah, I mean. That's a good question. Have I beaten? Yeah. Uh, no, I, I'm probably never going to, but uh, I'm told recently that if you get to a certain point, the inventory problems lessen up severely. Okay. So I'm very curious to get to that point and then see if I still have some of the same gripes. 
because again, at a fundamental level, I think there is a kernel of something enjoyable in there for me. Uh, it's just so masked by so many awkward decisions with the uh, yeah. gameplay progression that seem at odds with their general ethos about you know, relaxing. Have you uh, spoiled how it ends? Have you? Do you know how it ends? Somebody said it in Twitter, that so I sort of saw it. I, I don't know if it's been exactly spelled out, but I saw enough to know. Right, like, so I won't say anything because I spoiled it because I I'm not playing anymore because I spoiled it for myself. I wonder how much of it is you know the reason people aren't playing anymore is because hey like the gameplay mechanics obviously are a little lackluster. It's more of a relaxing game to play. Yeah. Uh, but then what the ending ends up being and people getting mad about that. Uh, I, I'm very curious uh, what the cause is, but. Oh, I forgot to change the topic. Look, it, I'm working on it, guys. I apologize. <laughs> um, I worry a little that that story as a headline could sort of be used as another way to dogpile on No Man's Sky to just, like, fulfill the internet's hate boner for it. Because <laughs> uh, it, it doesn't seem like... Anyone, Every week like, there's a new... you care if people are or, or not playing a game that you have decided you do or do not like? Right? What's the difference? Is it just so we can feel justified in going, look, let's hate on this game more? I actually, I, I really agree with that. And yeah. I was going to say, like, at first, I was like, I do think nobody deserves to be harassed, especially right. for stuff that happens, like, in the games industry. But I do think that some of the dogpiling on Hello Games is, if not a good thing, if from, like, a, whoa, let's not do that ever again sort of standpoint. At least, like, a cautionary tale, like, promise things that are actual concrete, or concrete, and, like, are actually going to make it in the game 100%. But... I, I do agree with what you're saying, is that, like, there's this weird compulsion in the games industry to not just be like, I like this game. Instead, it's like, I'm going to follow the ups and downs of, like, every game, every publisher, find out where this game fits in within the meta picture of, like, you know, is this hitting critical zeitgeist or commercial zeitgeist? It's like, I, I kind of also, like, just don't care. And I, I, I think you're right that it, I guess it really shouldn't matter to, like, people just sitting in their rooms playing video games, whether or not this has a lot of concurrent players, especially if it's not multiplayer to begin with, which is part of the controversy, I guess. Yeah. I mean, it... Everything's a controversy with this game, and I'm not even trying to say that it's great or that the controversy isn't partially warranted. It's just the degree that it goes on is all I'm talking about. That's all. Sorry, Mel. I was just going to say, what does it say actually on Steam when you go to the No Man's Sky? Does it say it's multiplayer? I don't know if that does. I know the physical well, the, release. Did you hear? Yeah, they like, put a sticker over it. Yeah, so <laughs> the, the box for the physical release, um, there it says single player and like seven and up, but it, it's actually stickered over the actual rating. And if you pull the sticker off, it says twelve and up with multiplayer. Yeah. Ooh. Yeah. So I that gets it's just not a, a miscommunication in the printing department when they got that sent out. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. Maybe it is whatever. That's. <laughs> Like, for me, it's not so much that I don't care. It's fascinating for me to watch. And I think people get up in arms, and they shouldn't get as up in arms as they do. I'm with you that they get people go way overboard. But they just don't like... I, I, I'm, I'm on the side of the people who are sick of false marketing and then leaving, like, right. trailers up on the Steam page that are not representative of the game anymore because that's just not what the game is. But it's still there. And apparently those are still there. At least they were there yesterday or the day before, and I, they might still be there. Like, they're the original trailers. And people just get pissed, so they just... The only thing they can do on the internet is shout, I guess, because that's all you are allowed to do on the internet is yell at developers. Um, so, in that regard, I'm on that side uh, of the argument. Like, I agree with them on that end. But to the point where people are, like, harassing and being ridiculous, I, I don't yeah. agree with it. But it's fascinating for me to watch, like, this cycle. Every couple of years, there's this game that makes a million promises and they don't learn from the last game that makes a million promises and then the consumers don't learn from the game yes, that made yeah. a million promises the time before that and it is a self-fulfilling and that's where i come down on it where i'm more upset with the people that are acting irrational right. than the people that caused the problem in the first place because you're buying into this cycle uncritically and unskeptically over and over and over again with dozens of possible bits of evidence you could use and I'm not saying they're justified to release things and break promises. None of that's right. But I think the hatred is misplaced in all being directed at one person or one small group of people when it should be spread over most of the industry because this is a very widespread problem. Yeah. So don't dogpile people. That's it's all. It's like, you know, when you like, you're watching TV at like three in the morning and like the infomercials come on and then they have like a rotisserie 
that has a fat collection tray. And then they'll have a dude give a testimonial and his before picture, he's like 400 pounds and now he's like a male model. And he's like, <laughs> yeah. yeah, I just ate, for every meal, I just ate like a whole chicken out of the rotisserie and the <laughs> weight melted right off. <laughs> if you're watching that, the sane reaction is, that's obviously <laughs> nonsense, right? Like, <laughs> that, that makes no sense. But yeah. with video games, I guess a lot of people must go for it or at least say like, it might not make me skinny, but at least I get a rotisserie out of it, which is valid. But anyway, regarding everything except for the metaphor, with video games, it's like, they do this all the time. You got, like, Ron Popeil on TV being like, this is the last video game you're ever going to need to own. We designed every atom in this game from the ground up. <laughs> that should hit a filter that is like, well, that's bullshit. this is idiotic. The bullshit like, filter. It's that, just right there. When I saw that, I was like, was there... Like, people actually believe that, that they procedurally generated every atom in the game's universe. Like, we can't even procedurally generate uh, our eyeballs worth of atoms in a friggin' it's, game, let alone... It's a scope problem. People have a really hard time finding perspective when they're already out of their depth with, oh, this game is making a procedural universe? I can't even comprehend how that's possible. So where where could they be taking this that I also can't comprehend? Maybe they're doing the atoms now. It's just been handled so wrong. I mean, we've we've going in circles at this point, but yeah, we're, developer we're hitting topics we've already hit. But can, yeah, developer we'll wrap it up. should have you know you know when Sean Murray was asked these questions on interviews, he shouldn't have been like, "Well, the game's so big, you probably won't ever see another player." He should just said, you know. You won't see another player because that functionality doesn't exist, blah, blah, blah. Uh, reviewers and stuff like that, you know, all these big websites. Like, I see Polygon and Verge. Yeah. They've oh, yeah. got such a boner for the game. You could tell they were hyped up and they're going to get a lot of views and stuff. So there's a million articles about them. And I feel like they haven't been, even afterwards, as critical of the game as they wanted because they wanted it to be big to get views. But all these review outlets were hyping it up and... And people see an article, clicks. yeah, and they see the headline, and oh, you know, this is going to be a great game. It gets people yeah. hyped up, yeah. and, lots of objectivity. Uh, and then you've got the kids making death threats over a freaking video game. It's just, it's you know, the whole cycle there's <laughs> is broken pretty much. So everyone yeah. is, at some point in this is sort of wrong, and it all adds yeah. up to a really fucked up system. Yeah. So and we're part of it as well, like yeah. to recognize it within ourselves. We could have just been like, hey, No Man's Sky came out and it's not that good or well-received. Yeah. But we're kind of like, even though we're saying, I don't want to be part of the dogpiling, we are kind of keeping it in the, you know, the spotlight. in the spotlight, exactly. And, be, and we're not keeping it in the spotlight for like, hey, you know, like they have good intentions. It's in the spotlight for, look at how, you know, this game that betrayed the public's trust is uh, eating shit a little bit, at least in like terms of concurrent users. I like to believe that we're sort of writing the meta narrative about it and hopefully discussing how the industry reacts to it more than the actual story itself. That's how I'd prefer to go about it, but granted, not everybody will see it that way. Tune in next week for more No Man's Sky news. We'll uh, make sure we let you know what's going patch on. Patch notes, man. Probably it's going to be like a patch announcement or something next week. <laughs> what we'll What is the, the worst case scenario No Man's Sky communication from this week? I think it's paid dlc that that's already been announced, announced. Oh. anything else the, they already... announced concepts of paid dlc but if they were like okay. coming out october 1st you know is a patch that addresses some of the concerns for things that we said would be in the game for free that would be i'd say the worst thing that they could do is take some of the patch notes from things they wish they put in and then put a dollar sign on them <laughs> that <laughs> yeah that would be that, I, i'm bad. with you that's probably <laughs> the worst thing they could do it's just giving me ptsd about uh, City Skylines. Oh, all over they can say Gotus Wars. No, <laughs> they're coming out with a n more DLC, right? And they're still like, you know, all these old problems since day one. That it just makes me really bitter when they do that kind of stuff. If No Man's Sky did that, like, <laughs> at least oh, City man. Skylines is like, you know, people would relatively like liked that game. Yeah, I mean, it's still like it's fun in a lot of ways. It's just now that it doesn't really have any competition, so there's less. Uh, I guess, yeah. need for them to really, like, go and fix some of the core issues, and and, and that, that bothers me, but anyways. Well, this, this actually leads nicely into the next topic uh, I have down, which is the Steam Spy thing. 
uh, which is actually how we get a lot of our numbers and how a lot of people get their numbers. So Steam Spy, for those who don't know, it's like an aggregate site where they use profiles of public, you know, Steam profiles to grab numbers of how many people play a certain game or own a certain game, and then they extrapolate like a certain number to, to kind of like take a guess as to how many people may have bought a game or, or are playing a game. And there's always like a plus and minus thing. Um, developers have come out saying that the site is accurate, but not precise, which is different, very important distinction. Um, and some developers had even uh, reached out to Steam Spy and said, take our games off of your website, including Techland, uh, which did Dead Rising, or not Dead Rising, uh, Dead Island. Yeah. Um, and Paradox was one <laughs> of those companies as well. And Steam Spy has decided to make the maneuver to say, you know, we're not going to take requests anymore. We're just going to put all that information out there. Um, Hell yeah! I think that's a good. I think it's a good sign. I think develop like there's varying reports as to why developers don't want their games on the site um, because it can affect, I guess, sales or pitching to publishers. Because like, hey, this game didn't sell as well as we can lie about it, that it did, or we would have liked it to, and. We can't hide the numbers because they're all in public, or at least uh, an approximation of the numbers are out there. And um, they're saying, uh, yeah, no more. We're not going to take developer requests to remove the games. We're just going to put everything out. So uh, that's interesting. I know, Nick, you had brought up the topic as well. What are your thoughts on the whole thing? I love it. I think that they shouldn't have any reason to be able to get their information taken down. Uh, because why would they ever do it if it was in their favor? Right? What would ever be the advantage to taking down good information that benefits them? Well, for Paradox, the idea was that, you know, they're going to put their stock on the Swedish stock market. So I think it was probably, it benefited them from like a business standpoint to be able to be like, hey, don't look at Steam Spy. Like, we're actually going to have to release our financial documents anyway. So, you know, and, and it worked out really well for them because they had 10 cents by like, 50% of the company outright or something like that for, you know, dozens of millions of dollars. So mm -hmm. I think there, the concern is that it's misinformation that could affect them from a business standpoint. All right, that's fair. I didn't ever think about it from that perspective. Neither did um, I. I was more thinking about it just of like, well, everyone's on an even playing field now. If you got something bad going on, everyone can tell, and that's good because more information. <laughs> so it seemed like the, the WikiLeaks of Steam Info to me. If I was That's... to be very hyperbolic. <laughs> Wookie so, leaks. can of worms. <laughs> yeah. Um, I, I mean, for me, here's... I think it's good that the information is out there. I just think that as long as that information <laughs> is couched in context, it actually makes sense. Like, what I've heard from developers is that Steam Spy, like Mathis has said, is accurate but not precise. So you can't just open it up and then be like, 30 bucks times, you know, 4,500 users, this is how much money they've made. Like, that can lead to some dangerous situations, I think, depending on how the information is used. You know, if we're out here being like, oh, and we, we've done this before, you know, Deus Ex, $60 times 107 or 186,000 active users, you know, they've made like $6 million on this game so far. Maybe that's accurate and maybe it's not. But um, I can understand that as a developer, it must be frustrating to have someone like in the ballpark talking about like what, drawing conclusions about how your situation based on information that may or may not be extremely accurate. Right. But um, I, I mean, for the most part, I'm glad that it's out there. But I am also sort of like, I, I don't know why it it's... exists. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm, I, except for curiosity's sake, yeah. and there's not necessarily yeah. anything wrong with that. Yeah, I mean, humans are curious and, and all that, but really, it, uh, the bottom line, I don't feel it's really going to change your enjoyment of a game knowing how much is spent developing it or not. And similarly, like, I don't know, people always make these, uh, you know, comparisons to, oh, I paid $600 for a phone, you know, oh, I hear it only costs, like, $200 to make it kind of thing. But also, people forget, too, uh, you know, development and design and R&D and all this kind of stuff. There's all these other costs that often uh, don't get factored into it uh, as well. So it's like, you know, you might think that they're raking you over the coals for charging $60 for a AAA game, but a lot of times the reason they're charging is because they have hundreds of people working on them and there's all these licensing fees and all this other crap. So like, you know, just 
Yeah, I like Ryan. I don't. It's interesting that it's there, I guess, but I, I still don't see any relevance to it. Well, it's good for us, uh, like for as far as uh, podcasting and stuff. Like, it's useful for us to be able to like, how many people own this game? We can talk about the topic and stuff. I think for the average user, though, you're right that it doesn't freaking matter. Like, no one's gonna look. They're not gonna care. It's more on like people within the industry using it, either the yeah. talking points or publishers looking at numbers and stuff. If for some reason yeah. the developer didn't give them numbers directly. Which I don't know how that works. You'd think you do, but you maybe you don't. Or I don't know. I think the other thing that I've heard from like biz dev people in the industry is like if someone's pitching a business case, they'll be like, okay, we're gonna make a roguelite and it's like we're gonna sell, let's say we sell like half as many copies as Nuclear Throne. Then they go to Steam Spy, take half that number and multiply it by like the actual price of the game and be like, so this is how much revenue we expect to make. Which I imagine is probably like a gross overestimate. Yeah. You know, when it comes imagine. to things like Humble Bundles and Steam sales and gift copies, that's more specific to Nuclear Throne in that issue. But like uh, people buying them on key resellers and then, yeah. you know, not everybody buying them is from a place where the price is X. You know, if you're buying it in, in Poland or something like that, the prices tend to be deflated, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, I, I think information is power and it's good that it's out there and it does give you some idea like you can look at this and be like okay deus ex has 190,000 owners estimated mm -hmm. oclos has 4,000. like that's i'm assuming deus ex mankind divided is bigger than oclos but considering they came out on like basically the same day it gives you some idea of the difference in magnitude between right. them but i i guess it's dangerous to to try to take that number and be like let's draw some like serious conclusions and, and base yeah. action based on it is my thinking I, I agree with that, and in my perfect world, I guess it would hopefully sway both ways in that, yes, you should have to put your info out there, but yes, you should also have the proper context given in any situation that someone would want that information. And, uh, you know, it's like Fox was saying earlier with the, um, like what I was kind of talking about with No Man's Sky, essentially, uh, this information, it just sort of, it's out there, everybody should hear it. And I kind of lost my train of thought, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> you were you were on the road. I was man. I was on a train, and then I you got derailed. You got off I'll, the hype I'll, train. I'll uh, I think it's important. Ryan made the distinction, though. True, like consumers probably, you know, really isn't any any need for other than curiosity, or you're generally interested in in uh, the economics of the situation. If you're a, a publisher or somebody who's looking to get into you know, funding games and stuff like that. Yeah, it's actually very useful. I mean, I'm thinking exactly of Dragon's Den. You know, you go on Dragon's Den. Uh, they excuse ask me, you, Shark Tank? Uh, excuse me. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, you go on and they're going to ask, you know, how many how many uh, uh, of this product have you sold? Or if you haven't sold it, you know, what's the market like in general? It's like, okay, well, roguelikes of this kind of nature typically sell between this and that and so on and so forth. So it is very useful in that regard, I suppose. But you just don't want to see people kind of misusing and misinterpreting the information that I guess don't reside within that, uh, you know, kind of profession. Right. Either way, uh, I, I do think overall, I'm, for, for us or at least, I think it's good to have those numbers readily available. Um, and we'll see if that's, I mean, I know they were talking, uh, the owner of the site was talking like, I don't think they can sue us, so hopefully they won't. So I'll be interested to see if, like, any developers end up taking, like, a legal step to get their info taken down off of this, off of the site. I don't know if they will. I don't know if it's that important to them, but it was a, a small talking point from the, uh, website owner. I guess we'll see. I remember what I was going to say. Okay. The uh, yeah. the information regarding the uh, No Man's Sky stuff earlier, how it was just sort of out there and then it would like not really affect anybody's actual decision-making process if you're actually just playing it. Like, I'd be a bit of a hypocrite if I tried to say that from both sides, right? It shouldn't matter what this data is if you're just an end user. So really, like you said, it is just for uh, yeah. people that are analyzing this stuff and in which case it should have the proper context. So you got to kind of follow it through the whole chain there. Information with context. Yeah. That is, and that is the important bit. Cool. Well, let's move on to something that I know I put on the docket, and I forgot to copy-paste it over to my proper docket, uh, which was PlayStation Go Now. PlayStation Now is coming to P. Is that what it's called? PlayStation Now? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> 
Pokemon I was a Go. new Sony initiative X. Yeah, basically the, the service that allows you to play PS3 games via like live streaming directly to the PS3 is coming to Vita. PC. V whatever. PlayStation Vita is coming to the PC. Actually, no, this is huge. Uh, the fact that you will be able to stream like old PS3 games that you may not own and be able to play them on your PC uh, is going to be big and is possibly a, a step towards like more cross-platform uh, friendly, like playing nice with, with one another, uh, which is kind of awesome because there are a lot of PS3 games that I never played that I would love to play. I'm You're not going to play them. That's probably true. Let's but there are still, honest. but there are still games that I would like to play. Like the statement holds oh. true. The next Honey Pop is exclusive to PS4. <laughs> so. I would absolutely, I would have to get it at, <laughs> at that point. Worth the investment for episode one alone. Uh, um, but I mean, I, I think it bears, bears mentioning just because, you know, we did talk about how Rocket League, you know, the cross platform capabilities are nice. This is like another step in that direction in a way mm -hmm, where yeah. now we can see PlayStation or Sony is playing nice with PCs and that can allow for all kinds of fun things. I don't know. I think that's pretty cool. What about you guys? I'm curious about the infrastructure. Have they outlined exactly how it works? Well, it's so. it's a cloud gaming thing, right? Like, it's not like you download Shadow of the Colossus yeah, for yourself right. or something like that. It's just like that. You get ad... some app that's a portal to the game on exactly. their server. Yeah. Right. Yeah. The website that I went to to read the story played like the loudest auto playing <laughs> ad I've ever heard and completely short circuited my train of thought. Gotcha. But um, <laughs> thanks, CNET. Um, either way, like, I, I mean, who was it that we went to was with me at PAX when they had, like, the wireless screen that was there with cloud gaming? And then people were trying to play, like, Saints Row, and it was super laggy, and, like, everyone was like, I can't I can't do anything with this. Like, it doesn't... That's what I worry that's about, sucks. is, like, if it was PS3 games coming out on PC, that would be cool-ish, even though I'm probably not interested. But, like, PS3 games that you have to go through the PlayStation Now service to play, I don't necessarily trust it to give you a good experience, but... uh I mean, I suppose we'll see, but there's a lot of stuff where I'm like, I just don't care. Like, they're like, coming, coming this fall to PC from PlayStation Now, Borderlands 2. <laughs> Who's going to buy Borderlands 2? Yeah. And then, like, or get Borderlands 2 on PlayStation Now and then play it on their PC with, like, the input lag. It doesn't make sense to me. Just get it on PC. <laughs> yeah, it's like two bucks in the Steam sale that happens 20 times a year. Listen. I, th I agree with you, I, but I think the, the bigger story here is like, hey, more cross-platform compatibility is always a good thing. It is, except they've sort of stopped supporting the Vita, which sort of tells me they don't really have their heart in it already, so why would they overextend themselves into more directions they might fail at? But Vita's been around for how many years now? Maybe that's just a sign that they're thinking of the next... Yeah, they should probably announce something about that, because I kind of get the impression they just kind of aren't doing anything else with it for now. Um, I would love it if they'd make an official Sony PS3 emulator and sell it for $100 for PC and let you just play would... your discs in your computer. That would oh, be this... sweet. This I know you wouldn't buy it, but I didn't say it's for you. No, <laughs> just... He's 150,000 years old. So many I'm years so old. That that's not... I don't think that's going to happen. I don't either. I just said I wish it did. Uh, it's funny, so I think it, it, well, it definitely started kind of happening around the Xbox 360 and the PS3. You started to see this kind of divergence from PC, you know, they're trying to make consoles the all-in-one entertainment system, and and then the, the you got the, the Xbox One and the PS4, they've kind of handled that pretty well, but it seems like they're going back. They're going back. Yeah, Xbox, Microsoft is uh, is making all their games, right? They're going to be playable on whatever. They're making modular Xbox 360, which is basically, you know, or not 360, Xbox One, whatever. It's basically going back to being a computer again so it can keep up with PCs. So I think that's Sony's just trying to do tit for tat on this situation. They're keeping up with how Microsoft is going. They see that PCs are still relevant and... And that's that's what they have to do. So, well, there you go. All right, I thought that, I I think it's cool, but I'm in the minority. That's I fine. think this is this is one of those things where, and maybe I'm coming a little over the top here, 
But like we look at the industry from the outside and we put like a check mark in the Sony column and we're like, good job, Sony. This is something <laughs> I will never do, but that was a nice thing that you did. And I'm like, it's a good thing, I guess. But I mean, I don't, I don't want to play like, you know, Resistance on my PC. I just don't care. You don't understand what kind of classic that is. That would but I, it's the kind of thing where classic. people are like, you know, hey, sweet, like a new restaurant opened up in my city. I'll never eat there, but like I'm glad it exists. I understand the belief, but it, I don't know if it, like, yeah. provides much benefit to many people. Especially because it's not out of the goodness of your heart, and you do have to subscribe to the PlayStation Now service for a monthly fee. True. It's not like it's lumped in with, I don't think it's lumped in with, like, PS Plus or anything. Which is going up $10 in a month. Yeah. Now that you mention it, who is the target audience for this? Kind of nobody. Like... Who's still after playing PS3 games that hard in the first place? It's great that they're making them available, but why not just have them downloadable on PS4 or, you know, support well, you putting the yeah. discs in? Like, That's no, true. I mean, they do that, but, like, why is that not just the initiative? Just get more games up to be available or give us a way that we can redeem our discs for download codes or something. Because they've done that in Japan with PS, uh, PSP. I uh, used to be able to trade in discs and get codes it, to download them oh that's cool maybe it's just more of a, a tech test you know older games typically have uh you know m more minimal requirements and stuff like that so uh if they're planning on expanding it to to newer games in the future because again with when you're talking in the the pc realm there's a pretty wide variance in terms of maybe, specs so that's maybe. why you've got their servers right they know the hardware and they'll know generally how many people are going to be playing that game at a given time, and they can allocate resources. Consoles typically are a fixed thing, right? The games are developed. They know exactly what the specs are, whereas when they do it for a PC, you've got minimum and you've got recommended and all that stuff. So by shifting it onto their servers and letting it be played on the PC, they kind of take away the the hardware element obviously there's the internet connection and speeds and all that stuff is a completely different issue but i think maybe they're just that's what they're trying to get into the pc market in that way that's um, dominated by their competitor <laughs> that's so weird <laughs> true yeah oh, that is weird well, now that i put a little bit more thought into it initially my reaction was like nice sony good job more cross-platform but now i'm like i don't understand the service Wait. Just wait until that app that they try to give you will be universally blocked across Windows 10. <laughs> <laughs> if it was PS4 games, I get it. I just, when someone's like, oh, sweet, like, you know, maybe Shadow of the Colossus is a good example. Like, oh, sweet, Bear Ratchet would sign up Clank, just for that. You know, Ratchet and Clank uh, Galactic Booty or whatever the one is, like the eighth Ratchet and Clank game <laughs> is finally available on PS3. Now I'll finally be able to go back and play it because that was the thing that was stopping me. I'm like, oh, I'll believe it when I see it, you know? It's like when you give some, somebody's like, oh, I've always wanted to like build my own furniture. And then you give them like a set of tools for Christmas. And then you're like, well, see you in six months, motherfucker. I want my dinette set. You better be yeah. able to tell me all about Ratchet and Clank Galactic Booty if you're excited about this. I've never played Galactic Booty, all right? But... It's interesting. I guess I'll keep an eye on it. I'll be curious to see how many people actually end up using it. I'm very curious how many people actually already use it on the PS4, but I can't imagine maybe it's not that many. Regardless, we'll uh, we'll keep an eye on it, and if it makes a splash, we'll let you know. Ratchet and Clank Future Quest for Booty. That's what it's called. Yeah, that's the name. There was a booty in there somewhere. They all have Good names job. like that. It's got a 77.8 aggregate rating on game rankings, man. I've been waiting eight years... <laughs> For the most convenient <laughs> opportunity for me to play Ratchet and Clank Future Colon Quest for and, Booty. And it's not, now I can play it on my PC. <laughs> God. Now I can finally have a good excuse to do it. Uh, moving on. All right. Now let's get to some games announcements. Uh, the big one Dark Souls 3's first DLC has been announced. It will be released on October 25th. I forgot the title of it because I didn't write it down. Because I am Ashen, a, Ashen something, something Dark Souls 3 DLC. Ashes of Ariandel. All right, yeah, Ashes go. of Ariandel. Uh, Ashes it, of my Grundle. <laughs> it will be. It will have a whole new area that'll be pretty PvP fo focused. A lot of new gear, and the trailer has some interesting lore bits for those who are interested in the lore, uh, like myself. 
And uh, for those who don't, well, the fact that it'll be PvP heavy apparently should also excite you. Ryan, are you excited for it? Have you even beaten... You did beat Dark Souls 3, right? Yes. You didn't beat the secret boss, though. <laughs> Depending on your perspective, I suppose. <laughs> <laughs> well, <laughs> got him. What's the other perspective of yes or no? I defeated every boss in the game except for the Nameless King, got the ending, could start New Game Plus. You know, I didn't pick up some Estus Shards either. I guess I haven't wow. finished the game. <laughs> Basically hasn't even started yet. Listen, Is the man. difference between... Uh, have you finished your meal, as in, are you full? Or have you finished your meal, is there no food left? I'm full, but there is food left on the plate. Good answer. <laughs> Sorry, I was changing the topic. <laughs> Listen, no man, problem. the uh, the Lost King, in my opinion, out of all the secret bosses... That's lost, not his name. His name or his name the Nameless, Nameless King. King. Sorry. The Spoilers. Nameless King <laughs> is... Uh, he's the most lore-important secret boss. Who cares? Well, Brian doesn't like play more. games for the fun of it, Mathis. When are you going to learn this? <laughs> <laughs> I should have realized that on a Isaac episode 2173. Hey, that'd be career suicide in 2014. <laughs> <laughs> NL jokes. Good times. <laughs> I'm excited for it. What about you, Nick? Yeah, I know I'll you beat it. it. Yeah, I'll play it. Uh, I, I had heard at first that it was going to be PvP focused, and I was a bit dismayed at that, but then I found it wasn't true. So, yeah, I'm in. Sure. Uh, if, if you haven't gotten 100 Pale Tongues and gotten to the top of the leaderboards for the Blue Brotherhood, then you haven't actually finished the game. So That's true. And I haven't. Well, it's... Wait, Nick, have you beaten the Nameless King? Yeah. Okay. You're the only one, Ryan. Well, Mal, oh. did you even play Dark Souls 3? Or... No, yeah, I'm still finishing Dark Souls 1. <laughs> right yeah. on pace to finish it. Hey, Mathis, how was Dark Souls 2, buddy? I did not be... I didn't like Dark Souls 2, though. It wasn't because it was too hard and I gave up. It's because Wait. I didn't enjoy it. That means I'm the only one here that's beaten all the Dark Souls games. It is. And you Bloodborne. Are... I, I have not beat Demon Souls, though. I haven't done Blood... I haven't beaten Bloodborne or Demon Souls, so... I didn't do the Bloodborne DLC, so I guess I'm out on that one. Or the Dark Souls 2 DLC, for that matter. Uh, I but I will play am... Dark Souls 3. I am not excited at all about a Dark Souls 3 DLC. And I think I am at Assassin's Creed Revelations point in the Dark Souls franchise right now. Really? I need, like, it's too much of a good thing right now. Okay. Like, I want, like, five years with no From Software Dark Souls game. Was Dark Souls 3 bad? No, Dark Souls 3 was great. And it was better than Dark Souls 2, I am willing to admit. But I'm, like, I'm done with it. If they, I'm, I'm not saying they shouldn't come out with DLC. Like, they should come out with DLC and make it, like, an awesome finale and then do something else for a few years and then come back and be like, new technology, we can make the game we wanted to make back then instead of just making, like, a fourth Dark Souls game, and I'm going to be stoked. Well, they did say a few months ago this Dark Souls 3 was the last... They went back and forth a bunch of times. Oh, have they? Okay. Yeah, but... I, you... It's like it's the last one, but Until, it also but sold. But the money's a nice. Oh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> we also sold was, a ton. We're gonna leave this open in case our publisher forces us to make more Dark Souls. <laughs> I, I, I don't think know. Like I, from software, may be done with Dark Souls. I I hope that they are for a little bit at least. I hope that there's a couple, at least two or three years, where there's no Soulsish game. Cause I I mean I don't want to be like I'm the canary in the coal mine, but I think people will stop caring. And I, I think well, I'm just I agree with that. stop. Okay. Well, they said they wanted to do something that's kind of more future-based, did they not? Like a sci-fi, like did. similar similar mechanics, just a different uh, universe, I guess. That well, I guess, that, yeah, I guess that the question then to you, Ryan, is are you more tired of the mechanics or are you more tired of the, the atmosphere and world? As, as minute, I'm trying to phrase this in a way that's respectful of the series because I really do like it, and Dark Souls 1 is probably one of my top 10 favorite games of all time. But... With that being said, every single Dark Souls game has been very, very similar. Like, it's been basically impossible yeah. to recreate that experience of being in an unfamiliar world and, like, trying to hack out how the hell you're going to survive here. Now, you know, you're like, I don't know what that enemy is, but he's running at me quickly. Let me access my stored knowledge of the right. 100 fast enemies I fought in the Dark Souls <laughs> franchise to figure out yes. what to do about it. Right? Like, there's there's not that many surprises anymore, and it's very hard to recreate that feeling of being like, you know, I'm going down into the graveyard a hundred times because I think this is where I'm supposed to go, and then 
it turns out you're actually supposed to go up the stairs to undead, but like that feeling yeah. of uneasiness and unfamiliar. Well, because you've had, yeah, you can't re, you can't chase the high. You're not going to get that same feeling and again. And that's what they've done. And everybody, correct. Yeah. everybody that's going to Dark Souls 3 having played the earlier ones is basically being dropped in at like power level over 9,000. Like they're already basically a Dark Souls 3 expert. Yes. You're still going to die because you've got to learn the geometry and the attack patterns uh, of bosses. The attack patterns and yeah. And but struggle you know, with a terrible camera on some boss fights. You know what to level and you yeah. know, you know, roughly when you need to roll to get invincibility frames. And, you know, it, I think it just gives you like you have such a leg up. I'd really love for them to just do something completely different. So it sounds like mechanics is what you're talking yeah, about. Yeah, I mean, I mean the Dark Souls the mechanics are great, but I'm kind of like, I don't need more of that. I, I think I would be almost as happy to just play through Dark Souls 1 again as I would be to play through a Dark Souls 4 if it's as good as Dark Souls 3. Because they're, I mean, you can, it's like you said, they're kind of the same with a nice shiny coat of paint, I guess. Yeah, sort of. And, and I have a, uh, a predilection, which is maybe not that common, of like, I don't mind doing the same thing 100,000 times in the same game. Especially... If you wanna... Yeah. A new game with the same mechanics? Not interested, apparently. <laughs> but if you want, I'll just play the same game a thousand times. That's what I'm good at. <laughs> I guess, it's, especially if you're not a huge fan of, like, the world and the lore, I mean, the game can definitely feel very samey. Uh, one of the big things that kept me going through Dark Souls 3, as hard as I did, is the I found the story really interesting. Because, in a way... This Dark Souls three could very well end dark. Like they could be done with Dark Souls if with the way they they framed the story, and the amount of like fan service that was packed into Dark Souls three, they could be done with it. Um, if you're not interested in the story, I can see how Dark Souls three could get boring pretty quick, just because you're like I've played it before. I enjoyed it, but I have no attachment to it. Like I I do think it's a good game. If I do like a year end list, there's a good chance it would be in the top ten, maybe even the top five. But I, I don't really have, like, nostalgic feelings about it. And maybe part of that is, you know, I already blown that out on Dark Souls yeah. 1. But I don't know. I just, like, I – at some point, I'm like, I, you've just done it too many times. Like, it, you know, oh, yeah. like, superhero movie fatigue where you're like well, – I yeah, don't, actually. I'm not like, sick of me. Oh, well, <laughs> I like, have this, this movie's, like, good. But in order for me to really like a superhero movie, it actually has to be incredible now. Because every, there's been, like, ten a month that do, like, adequately. So yeah. I just feel like Dark Souls is kind of like that where, like, I don't know how. A great Dark Souls 4 is, like, less important to me than a decent attempt at something different. At least for now. I mostly agree with Ryan on this, actually. And I would much rather that they take a few months or years or whatever it takes for them to get their head on straight for the right attempt at whatever they're going to do next. Um... As much as I'm a massive fan of Dark Souls, I think it is a bit too formulaic. And at this point now, they're really riding on this concept that what makes the game great is this pattern of combat boss, really hardcore boss, right. weird item, combat, combat, get lost for a second. Like, it's all sort of the same loop. And what I think really made Dark Souls special was actually not just the combat. And yes, the, comp the combat complemented the game really well, but it was the feeling of this world. And it was the feeling of how the atmosphere came together and the feeling that it was larger than you and getting lost in that world and trying to understand what you're even doing. The fact that you didn't even have any expectations, everything was subverting you everywhere you went. And it was all clever feeling because it was all new. Yeah. And they didn't really approach the sequels in a way that felt clever enough to me to differentiate them from the original in a way that felt meaningful beyond just the combat is fun. And that is true. The, the premise that the combat is fun and the bosses are exciting is enough to get it by, but I don't think it's enough to really totally move the formula forward in a way that feels like real progression. So that's where I landed on 3. I thought it was fun, I enjoyed it, and I will play the DLC, but I don't feel like it competed in the same realm as Dark Souls 1 because they didn't approach it from a totally new angle. So that's what I think they need to do. And even Bloodborne, honestly, they went further in the direction of combat being the main focus yeah. rather than atmosphere and exploration. And yes, there was good atmosphere, and yes, there was some exploration, but largely the game was still mostly linear. Um, most of the games have been mostly linear. So that's where I think the, the series faltered a little bit. And if they spent more time working on the level design than the big crazy boss that they're going to feature in the trailers, I think I would have more fun with it personally. Do you think a lot of the problem is that they're very much competing with themselves? They don't really have anybody in the same genre, quote-unquote, trying to push them into new areas because 
the only competitors they've had so far have failed. There was that... I can't remember the name of it. Lords of the Fallen, I think it yeah. was. Yeah, Lords of the Fallen came out. I remember preview videos of it being like, it's going to be like Dark Souls, but like colorful and, and different. And there's like, these are the things that it's going to end up doing different, but it ended up being like shit. Um, and I can't think of any other games that have kind of been similar to Dark Souls that have come out that have really challenged, I guess, oh. what would you call like a, a super hard third person action, like genre, like whatever... To Weird. be fair, like, every other game that's come out in the last three years has said it's the Dark Souls of whatever, so... It's, <laughs> which which means nothing, software, really. Yeah. Necropolis was one, right? Yeah, that, I guess. That was, yeah, sort that was... Of. Salt and Sanctuary was another that, like, kind of pushed it, I, I, I guess. Neo is the only one that I can think of that's coming out that is going to be, like, I guess similar in the mechanics, but... Yeah, no, I, I mean, I know somebody in chat said they don't think competition is the problem here, but without competition, you have no reason to push forward. I, I think of Madden a lot when it comes to not having competition, so no need to push their genre forward because they're the only ones that exist, and they're good. The game is good, but it doesn't do anything new, and every game that comes out doesn't really feel any that much different than the last one. I think they were struggling with where exactly they wanted to land uh, with their gameplay identity. Uh, is this more of something they want to push towards the mainstream where the action is the focus or is this more about the lore and the, the mystery, mm -hmm. in which case that would take it away from the mainstream. And whenever you're chasing big dollars, obviously it's a little difficult to justify moving out of the mainstream when you see yourself poised for that very easily. Um, and everyone wants to advertise you and everyone wants to talk about you. How do you deny that mainstream appeal? Right. And I think that's kind of where they ended up landing. And I'm not saying they did it to such an extent that they, like, sold out or something. It just did feel a little bit like they were headed in that direction of the extreme action game that they wanted everybody to believe it was. Yeah. I just think, like, it's harder to impress people with the same thing, even if it's, like, really good. Yeah. Over and over. Like, it, it's like, uh, you know, the, look at, like, the iPhone. When the iPhone was first announced and first came out, people were like, this is amazing, it's changed the paradigm of phones, like, I didn't know my phone could ever be this. <laughs> and then, you know, we're here, like, three years later, and we're like, oh, so the camera's only gonna be, like, one megapixel better? Like, uh, yeah, okay, it's a better iPhone, but so what? That's like, true. It, yeah. at some point, mm. novelty does count for something, and, you know, you, th I think there is such a thing as too much of a good thing in diminishing returns, so... I mean, I, I, people in the chat are like, they already said this was gonna be the last one. Yeah, but, like... Yeah, but like, here's know, a million, like ten million dollars. Last it talks, one talks cheap, right? Like, yeah. maybe this is the last one. How long is like the statute of limitations? Or maybe on this that? is the last one Miyazaki will be a part of, but exactly. there's a development team that'll work on it separately, like Dark Souls Two. So we'll see. Uh, we'll see what happens, but I hope that it. Uh, I hope that they do something interesting that is not Dark Souls related next. I'd be game for this weird cyberpunk thing that they kind of floated out there as an idea. I'd be interested in that for sure. Someone in chat said people still buy Mario Kart. Yeah, but there's been like 10 Mario Karts over the I've course. A lot. Yeah, since like the N64 era. There's been four Dark Souls, basically. I'm going to count Bloodborne in there. There's been four Dark Souls in five years. Like, that's crazy not talk. SNES era, I'm sorry. <laughs> I forgot there was an SNES one. Yeah, that's true. Well... The expansion, regardless, I think we'll all, for the most part, play it. Um, except for Malf, maybe in like 20 years when he gets to it, he'll play it. But uh, I'll just get PS Now or whatever. <laughs> That's true, yeah. You can Stream just get your PC. PS yeah. Go. Uh, Dark Souls 3 Ashes of Ariandel DLC coming out October 25th. I'm excited for it. Moving on to another expansion that I don't particularly care about, but Ryan might, Nick might, maybe Malf, I don't know, is the Endless Legend expansion. Anybody here play Endless Legend? I, I haven't tried it yet. Wait, that's the uh, that. endless dungeon, dungeon of the endless. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Software, four X. Yeah, I played. I actually, because that was a game I played that years ago when it was still kind of, I guess, earlier uh, alpha or beta. I really enjoyed it. Actually, I'm kind of sad I didn't spend more time with you're, it. You're all wrong. I'm just gonna let you just stop. <laughs> endless Legend is the civil civilization strategy one. What do you mean I'm all wrong? That's exactly what I said. Did you? Did you? I thought you said on this dungeon, Dungeon of the Endless. That's what I dungeon said. Dungeon Endless is the publisher. Like they they published. Wait, what? <laughs> I don't know what's Studios happening. Studios developed and published the Endless series, Endless Space, Dungeon of the Endless. And I thought Endless. you were talking about Dungeon of the Endless. I'm like, no, it's Endless Legend. 
My 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 mistake. I misunderstood. <laughs> Continue, Malf. I'm sorry, my friend. No, I was just saying. Uh, I I I enjoyed what uh, time I did spend with Dungeon of the Endless. I thought it was a a pretty uh, nice balance of that kind of uh, uh, what do you call it? Fortress defense slash rogue like. Fox, we're not talking about Dungeon of the Endless. That's though. what I was saying. That's what I was saying. <laughs> he said continue with it. I'm confused now. Okay, so Endless Legend, for those who don't know, is like a Civ strategy, civilization style strategy game by those developers. And they announced a new expansion that will add naval warfare, sea fortresses, and a whole new major faction. That's that's the game I was talking about. I don't even know this game at all. Endless Legend? All right. <laughs> Ryan, have you played Endless Legend? Yeah, I played a couple hours of Endless Legend. Uh, I think it was 2014. Yeah, and it came out a few years ago. It was like, that game is really well respected for people who are fans of the 4X genre. And the studio, Amplitude, is like really good. Fox is talking about Dungeon the Endless and Endless Space as well. They've always done like their own unique spin on these genres. I found it like a little too... Um, Minutia driven, I guess, for mm -hmm. me personally. Like, as compared to coming a from a guy like, who enjoyed Europa Universalis. Well, yeah, it took me like a hundred hours to to do anything in Europa Universalis, <laughs> though. This I only spent like two hours with it, and it was like, it was like EU four, but it was like the tutorial was like, you know, you can design your own units and like mm -hmm. build up, build them up that way. And I was like, that's too much. I want to make like a phalanx and send them to conquer, you know, the Mongolians, basically. So I didn't really get that into it, but I heard that it was really well respected. So, I mean, an expansion for it is good news. And the 4X genre is kicking off, you know, between Endless Legend and its DLC and Stellaris and Civ Six coming out. You know, it's it's a good time to be a fan of 4X, I suppose. And Amplitude Studios recently got bought by Sega. So it's interesting to see. I think this might be the first project they end up releasing from them. So it, it seems like starting them off on the right foot. I'm excited for it. I put a little bit of time into it as well, um, but I didn't play it when any of the expansions came out. Um, but apparently, the all is like what three or four expansions that exist already, and apparently it ended. It did a ton of uh, additional stuff and really kind of fleshed out the base game. Um, and I, I wanted to dive back into it, but I will. Uh, this this is exciting for me because I think uh, exp expanding into you know naval stuff adds a whole layer of strategy. I gotta that, expand uh, in the, your naval. <laughs> don't don't ever. Don't ever say that again. Cool. Well, I'm excited for it. Uh, we'll uh, we'll move on to something Nick can talk about. Nick finally beat AM2R, and finally. I'm excited to know what how another, that was like because I watched a review Nick of it actually. Make, yeah, so it was really good. It was really really good actually. There was there's some problems with it that are actually because there are problems with Metroid 2. Like almost nothing about this I feel like was made worse by the fan remake version of it. And I would go so far as to say it might be one of the best actual Metroid games that exists if you include it in the group of the official ones. So uh, it, from a Metroid fan, I would go so far as to say highly, highly recommended. If you care at all about Metroid, you should go check out M2R. Um, if you don't know, it's a remake of Metroid 2, which was only on Game Boy. And it was not a great game. I think most people would go so far as to say... Uh, the biggest problem with it largely was the map was very, very small in that Samus had to be two tiles high and the Game Boy screen resolution is not very large to begin with. Right. So you end up with a character that's disproportionately tall for the amount of screen size you have to work with. And it just makes the whole game really awkward. Um, and not only that, but Metroid is a game that's known for being obtuse in the first place. And when you can hardly tell the difference between what area you're in, because, uh, <laughs> it makes it very difficult to really figure out what the hell you're doing. So they went and took... That formula applied it to a whole new coat of paint, a new engine. Uh, the developer worked on this thing for years and years he and finally came out with too, it. Right? Um, as far as what? Didn't he add a couple of like custom bosses and stuff as well? Yeah, yeah, actually that is true. I didn't think about it because I never finished the Game Boy version mm -hmm. because it was just not a great game. I was quite right. bored by it. Uh, but yeah, I think the like the robot boss and the hunter boss, there was maybe even a couple of extra areas that he expanded on, but it felt like a really complete solid game. Um, in fact, there's, like I said, very little that I would criticize over it that wasn't just a fault of the original game. Um, so yeah, go play it. I, Like I said, nothing really bad to say about it. That's awesome. I'm, 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 and Nintendo hasn't taken it down? Well, they or said they it can't exist, but it's kind of up anyway. Once so. it's on the internet, it's out there kind of thing. Yeah, cool. you shouldn't have much trouble finding it. And it's even been updated since they told it to come down. So, <laughs> um, you know, go, go look for it. It won't be too hard to find. Yeah, go check it out. AM2R. Find it wherever you can. Uh, and that brings us to N++, which is another game I have not played. 
I played N, which was a Flash game. Man, this, what did you play this week? Uh, Deus Ex, pretty much exclusively. And I've been playing through Oddworld Stranger's Wrath, so. I know. Judge Mathis thing, don't worry. Better uh, than Dota, <laughs> Austin. Fair <laughs> enough, yeah. <laughs> Austin. No Rob, no Austin. No, <clears throat> no Dota talk. Um, N++, so this is like the third game in the N series. It is a momentum-based like precision platformer, I guess. And Ryan kind of liked it. I don't, I don't know shit about it. I saw your video and I saw the comments and that's all I, I know about it. So take the floor, Ryan. Hit me with N++. Yeah, N++. It's like Super Meat Boy. Although if you're a turbo nerd about the genre, you're going to be like, it's not Super Meat Boy. It's more momentum-based. and more you momentum-based and physics-based and a little bit more minimalistic. And you collect gold, which actually increases a timer. Yeah, it's it's strange in the sense that it's not just about getting to the end of the level. You have, like, a time limit. The time limit is extended by gold that you pick up. Usually some of that gold is easy and is on your route, and some of it is going to require some more difficult jumps. Oh, look who's playing uh, <laughs> just saw. Dota 2 right now. Austin <laughs> signed on. Oh, no. <laughs> He's watching I mean, the podcast. I, I think the game is hurt. good. Here is my central concerns in the video after playing for, like, almost two hours. We're like, it seems a little easy to... Finish the levels. You know, to 100% the levels requires a little bit of extra chutzpah, but to just finish the levels has been easy. And apparently this was uh, an unfair criticism because the game gets very hard, but in an hour and 40 minutes, I didn't encounter a level that had really taxed me. There was one, like, as Mouth maybe got to, there's one that's like a half pipe that took me a while to get to, like, the switch to be able to open the door. And then there's one that's a circle that might have taken, like, eight or eight or nine times. But, like, for the most part... I haven't found it that difficult to start with, but apparently, you know, I don't want to be dismissive, but further into the game, it becomes substantially difficult. I, and there are thousands and thousands of levels. But, yeah. uh, I mean, what, what annoyed me was a gentle difficulty curve that kind of assumes very little, Topic. I guess, acumen in these games. And I kind of feel like maybe it starts you off a little slow. If it gets more engaging... You know, five or six hours in, that's fine. But I, I still found it a little easy in the early game. I was yeah. watching BizSnap play this when it came out first on PS4, and he was like 500 levels into it or something. And it, he was having a lot of trouble with it because, it, from what I could tell, it gets to be one of the hardest platformers out there. 18 quintillion uh, levels. You, you may have to play it for a very long time to get to that part, but there's also a completionist element where you try to basically do the levels as perfectly as possible. And, uh, you know, there's several different metrics that you can gauge yourself on. So uh, the difficulty complaint, I, I think it depends how much you play it or what you try to do. Yeah, I think it could be personal preference. But for me, I, I typically I'm not huge into those sort of N, N plus games. Super Meat Boy is not something I ever felt driven to uh, to finish. But, you know, I put in I put in some time into N plus plus and uh, save for one level, which I was just being really dumb and and didn't realize what i had to do at first i was getting through them all first try a couple of them i i just retried as a goal i could clearly do that a little bit better sort mm -hmm. of thing but afterwards it's like all right that's it like i think maybe the difficulty curve they if they had a shifted it a bit more so it started to challenge you a little bit sooner um maybe that would have been enough to keep me playing and be like all right one more one more um but after getting through a couple dozen, just on first try, it's just like, eh. But that's Would you like, recommend it to, like, platforming fans in general, or...? Uh, well, it, how much does it cost? It's, it's 12 bucks. Like, it's pretty cheap mechanically, and it's robust in terms of content. Like, I can't dispute that. Yeah. What, I, I kind of... What, what happened to me, I think, is what you're getting at here as well, is that basically... I got bored before the game had a chance to really hook me. Like, I just found myself being like, yeah, I can just run to the end of the level in all these levels. And uh, this is my own mistake. I did the whole tutorial like an idiot. <laughs> and apparently, um, that's not something you have to do if you've ever used an analog stick and an A button before. So I will take full <laughs> responsibility for that. I also think that from a, like a user interface perspective, there is some work that should be done there because like the way that it was structured, I actually didn't know that that was a tutorial. Like it was called intro. I, mean, I don't know. Is right. intro tutorial? Is that optional? Like I have is no that idea. Optional? 
well it is it is optional oh, okay. but i didn't know intro Ooh. to me doesn't necessarily scream optional if you slap something intro i'm gonna play it because i assume it's imp like the beginning of the game and yeah. then like there is there's two different ways to play through the episodes you can play through them horizontally which is like a gentle learning curve mm -hmm. or you can play through them vertically which is a, a steeper learning curve and people like let me know in the comments i talked to the developer and he let me know that afterwards as well and i was like i get it but also like how am i supposed to know that wasn't that? intuitive yeah that's not if it's not i mean it's not handheld if it's not spelled out for you you're not gonna know when you start the game there's like a wall of text that's just like you know welcome to n plus plus and then like here's the optimal way to like mechanically get through the game you need to like master all these mechanics i really like it's a no nonsense like mechanics driven platformer and right. i would have liked a little bit more nonsense like <laughs> as much as i don't care that much about like the story of super meat boy that game had a lot of style and i think i missed that a little bit in m plus plus but that might be something where your mileage may vary as well if you really like the visual style and I really, I think that if you put in the time to get great at it and don't find yourself getting bogged down by early game levels, like maybe underestimate, you know, where you're starting from, um, then, you know, you could really get to some good stuff. You could get to some levels like Super Meat Boy where you're like, every single jump is like perfect here and I'm maintaining all my momentum and getting to the exit in a really good time, getting the bandage, et cetera, et cetera. In M++, I found myself being like, ah, I miss like one gold, who cares? I miss one. It's like the difference between trials of being like, I'm going to beat this level faultless and like, ah, you know, it's easy enough to get to the exit. I felt twice. Who is cares? it because the levels move too slow? Like one of the things that I liked about Super Meat Boy is that the levels are relatively quickly, which gives you the incentive to like perfect a level. You're like, this didn't take me too long. It's quick. And I know what I need to do. I just need to do it. Is N plus plus like the reason you don't care about perfecting the levels because of the mechanics or because it's like too the slow levels are too sluggish or slow for like a platformer like that. You know what I'm asking? Do you understand like yeah, the yes. wording here? Wow. I feel some people play, it's kind of like, I'm going to take the path of least resistance if I'm given the option a lot of times. So mm -hmm. that's where, you know, Ryan's saying just like a lot of time you just, you can run to the exit. Of course, they've got coins kind of up in this corner, that <laughs> corner. Uh, the end game for people who really are perfectionists and whatnot, obviously you want to have the most time by the time you get to the door. So you're going to go back and find the optimal way of collecting all the coins or as many of the coins or whatever the optimal path is in that way so it's like i don't know but i feel like because of the lack of narrative you don't care as much it's I, not it's not hooking me in each room is just like you know stylistically it's kind of interesting in a some way but after a while it's just is it well I'm, I'm just trying to think now one of the things i guess maybe if there were a ton of collectibles in each level of meat boy do you think you feel the same way like fuck that last i don't know in a way, I actually do. Like, I feel like if every level of Meat Boy was like there's 100 pieces of bacon to pick up in every single okay. one, then if you only get 91 of them, I think you're less likely to be like, I'm going to go back and get the other nine than you are when there's yeah. just one bandage that's in like a super difficult place. Yeah. This is why I couldn't get into Dust Force, actually, for the same reason. There were just too many things to do too perfectly, and it sort yeah. of took a little bit of the player autonomy away. I have to wonder, though, with N+, and I still haven't uh, N I haven't played N++ yet. I will be playing it, though. Uh, and I have played N+, and the original N. This is a game that's been in sort of uh, stages of development as an idea for about 10 years now. And I have to wonder if there's a stage where eventually it becomes almost over-designed in that they yeah. know what they want, and then they just iterate so much that you feel like you need to produce every possible permutation of game concept. And what that ends up resulting in is sort of gameplay clutter that doesn't necessarily make the game more enjoyable or meaningful, mm -hmm. but pads out an experience to seem more robust. Uh, so that's where that difficulty curve might get a little muddled. But I also understand where they're coming from, where they want to make it approachable from different perspectives for people with different skill levels. I just don't know if presenting it in the form of hundreds and hundreds of levels is necessarily the right incentive. I'd rather do really well at fewer levels than do marginally well at hundreds of them because it feels like you're making a bigger difference then it feels like you're actually making more progress yeah. so it, i guess it's just a, a fundamental dynamic about how you want to approach game design and in their case having done it for so many years now is this really the end result of all that work or is this just a pile of different ideas put together i don't know i hope it's a little of both maybe i feel like um the, it's not well curated like, maybe it's mm -hmm. two different development philosophies, but, like, Super Meat Boy is 
200 levels, right? Or uh, 240 levels? It's amazingly versatile depending on how much you want to get into it because there's different points you can bow out at. So yeah. it depends. It, it's, yeah. it's not 240 because, like, the sixth world only has five levels or whatever. But anyway, it's, it's somewhere in, like, the 150 to 200 range, I think, if you yeah. count the Dark World and levels. they're very short. They're extremely short. I probably have played 150 to 200 levels in N++ already, and I can remember, like, three of them. I can remember right. half pipe level, I can remember circle level, <laughs> and then like level that introduced me to boost pads. Like those are the, the three <laughs> levels that I remember. And I feel like you could, again, for me personally, some people might enjoy there being like a thousand levels, even if they aren't necessarily particularly clever, at least as, as they struck me. But like I found myself being like, I don't need all these levels. Like these levels are just an excuse to to have more game to some extent. I would have preferred like, you know, clever level, clever level, clever level, surprisingly yeah. tongue twistery to say. But then as opposed, and maybe cut the number of levels down by like, you know, not a factor of nine or something like that. Go from like a thousand levels to a hundred as opposed to just like, we got a lot of levels. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter to me, but. You know, I, I have to, that's like something I kind of respect about uh, the whole you know, curated experience, and it's it's reminding me of a slight tan tangent here. But there's a burger place near my work that they have all these, you know, different types of burgers with some pretty interesting ingredients and stuff. It's not like your typical burgers, but on most of them, they have a thing that says like, "Please don't add toppings and stuff." You can get a normal cheeseburger and get your pickles and your lettuce, whatever the heck you want on it, but they have their signature burgers, and they don't want people to. To change it so it's like this is exactly what we want you to experience this is how it should be maybe you don't like that but like if you don't get the fuck out of here basically <laughs> um and it, you know it's, it kind of takes some guts as, as especially as a food as a restaurant to do that sort of thing but i feel standing your ground is it that's that's oh you know, it's it's pretty cool and that makes me respect uh you know super meat boy a little bit more because of that whereas this is just like here's a different shape of a room we've probably generated with some kind of engine we'll put the coins here and there and like let people find whatever the best route time is, is whatever the They're best route is very very careful in the stepping up of the difficulty curve in Super Meat Boy and having a really nice balance of teaching you new mechanics and also iterating on them in a way that feels like you're really getting somewhere. Uh, and, the, and the curve is just really balanced. And I think the difference is here we're dealing with just a ton of levels where it's just sort of like, well, you kind of get how running and jumping works. We're just going to play around with that for a while and see what sticks. And then we're going to add missiles and we're going to add electric people. I mean, that's the way it was in, in N+, plus anyway. And I had fun with it because the mechanics feel good and the physics feel good and there's something gratifying about nailing those jumps with that sense of weight as you move across. But if you are fighting those physics and you don't enjoy that feeling, it's going to feel stressful pretty quickly when all you're doing is kind of similar permutations of similar concepts. I feel I, like, I, in defense of the game... A lot of the comments were like, NL, like you're, you don't understand what you're talking about. <laughs> and like the reviews are pretty overwhelmingly positive. Right. Some people are saying like, this is the best platformer I've ever played. Hmm. It strikes me, maybe this is one of those things where like, if you're, it, for, for a certain subset of the population, this is the game that they've been waiting for, for like 15 years. For someone who's like, a, you know, Johnny come lately to the franchise, I did find myself being like, I feel like Meat Boy just does it better. Like, I, I know that it's hard to judge it because it was six years ago and I have a lot of nostalgia associated with it. But I was like, this is not as clever as Super Meat Boy. That doesn't mean it's bad. Right, like, yeah. it, I still had a decent time playing it. But yeah. I was like, it, it really highlighted for me a lot of the things that Super Meat Boy does right. Like, for example... Uh, only having 20 levels per world and then having like a difficulty spike and you know having some style and a little bit of a story that even though the narrative doesn't really matter at least it's kind of clever and you know it's got some cute stuff going on with it this is like we've built this ninja mechanic and then we've built for, for what is all intents and purposes infinite levels that you can play it in it's cool i mean it's like a platform sandbox but it's not the kind of thing i'm looking for in a game like this i guess I mean, before before we leave topic, I'm curious. I don't know if anybody knows, but um, from N plus to N plus plus, 
have they changed anything mechanically or is N++ more like a level pack? That would have to be Nick, honestly, because yeah, I, I, I played N+, plus, yeah, N plus play. in like 2008 for two hours. Like, I'm, I'm pretty unfamiliar. It's been, a, it's been a long time. The little bit I saw looked quite similar, but I, like I said, I didn't play it, so I don't know yet. And I hope I didn't come across as being like wholly negative, because I actually am looking forward to playing this, and I think I'll probably enjoy it. I was just sort of hearing what Ryan was saying and understanding like where he was coming from with that. And I can kind of identify that that line of thinking too, and I just don't know if I'll fall into it or not. But I think I probably won't because I liked N. Mm. So, well, I'm actually curious uh, what your thoughts are on it when you do get around to playing it, and I'm I'm curious if it is like a level pack or if it's there's different mechanics to really call it a sequel. But uh... yeah, I think it's like you're like, how did this game take like eight years to make? Is like going to a restaurant and being like, why is this soup like a hundred dollars? <laughs> like the chef is in the kitchen, like shaving garlic with a razor blade. <laughs> and you imported like saffron from the most particular genius of saffron. Like to the, to the unrefined palate, such as myself, it just tastes like soup. And this game just feels like, you know, a decent platformer. Right. But for the kind of person who's really honed in on it, maybe this is exactly what they've been looking for. Yeah. Makes sense. Well, N++ on Steam right now, you said twelve ninety nine. Yes, so eleven ninety nine. Eleven ninety nine. If that's your cup of tea, apparently there's a bajillion levels you can go check out. Last game we're going to be talking about today is Deus Ex Mankind Divided. Uh, it is the sequel to Human Revolution, which was 2011, I believe. Um, and it takes place a few years after that, after the events of Human Revolution, um, I think, Malph, have you put any time into it yet? No, I uh, downloaded it overnight, so okay. I'm probably going to check it out this weekend. So me and Ryan don't want to put uh, any time into it. Ryan, how far into the game are you so far? Okay, so I beat the intro mission. Yep. And then I went to Prague, and I did, like, f I got my, my augmentations back. Yep. And I did, like, three side missions. So I'm, like, four hours into the game, basically. Have you used the subway yet? Yeah, several times. Okay, so and you the, and I are probably similar in where The number are. one thing on the subway is that you should install this game on your solid-state hard drive. Uh, I was going to bring it up. The load times are fucking awful in this game. They're so dude, long. On, on my hard drive, to go on the subway from, like, one part of the city to another is two to three minutes. So yeah. put this Oof. on your solid-state drive. Yeah. My hard drive is also fucked. Like, it's, it's probably dying, but... Some of us don't have 60 terabyte solid states, Ryan. We can't. I'm just saying, it. like, if you can put it on your solid state yeah. drive, I would recommend it. I don't have the room. What are your thoughts on it so far? I actually really like it, and I think it fills like a niche in the market that has not existed for a while. Like, maybe I'm ignorant of it, but I was like, when was the last time like I was excited about a AAA game? Yeah. <laughs> it's like Dark Souls Three, maybe, or <laughs> right? Am I completely forgetting something that came out in between there? I actually might be. But uh, the I, World of Warcraft I, expansion. I feel like I've been there's been like lots of really good small games, but I was kind of hankering for like a Hollywood blockbuster, and it's is fitting the bill right now. I'm having a good time with it. I'm not gonna play more because I want to um, leave it open just in case I could do it on like a subscriber stream later uh, or something okay. like that. Gotcha. But I've had a good time, and the uh, I I appreciate that it's a stealth game but it's extremely large. Like, it's a stealth RPG. Yeah. And coming off of Dishonored, which is also a great game... I just came off Dishonored too, so yeah. But, I don't you. know about you, I beat it in, like, eight hours. So I'm thankful to have a game where maybe I can get to a level of being decent in stealth and still have the ability to practice that for a long time instead of just, like, finally I understand how to blink, and then... <laughs> Now it's over. Well, right? let's just be clear. You beat Dishonored so quickly because you played it like a murderous madman. That's not true. I got low chaos, man. You got low chaos? Yeah, and it was easy. Well, did you... Is it because you didn't kill the main targets? Did you, like, save them no, mostly? No, I, 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 I definitely killed less than 10 people in the whole game. <laughs> All right. I thought you just played it like a, a murderous psychopath. No way, man. Uh, I'm coming at it from the same angle, actually. I just beat and played through Dishonored 1 plus one of the DLCs. I haven't played Brigmore Witches yet. Um, and coming into it, maybe it's, the mechanics are really solid. Like, if you played Human Revolution, it's really mechanically very, very similar. Um, they pull the whole Metroid, like, your character gets injured and he loses all of his augmentations. Now you have to earn all those augmentations back. 
Plus, here is like a ton of new ones that you can play with um, that you can enjoy. And they kind of add this uh, overclocking feature where some of the augmentations will use more power than others. So you have to like disable some that you're not using to maintain the power to use the other ones. Otherwise, your HUD gets all glitchy and stuff, which is cool. Uh, but the the stealth mechanics, like you can play guns tote and first person shooter, run in and kill everybody. But I, I honestly think it is meant to be played as a stealth game. It, yeah. it it heavily incentivizes going through it quietly. Um, lethal or non-lethal, I haven't really seen the game push you in one way or another. Uh, I've been playing non-lethal personally, but the powers are really cool. It looks gorgeous. One weird critique I have of it is, like, standing still, the game is really pretty, mm. but once, like, the faces start to move, you're like, mm, something's not right there. You know what I mean? Does that make sense? I don't know. Like, I've seen crazy? people complaining about it, but I I thought it is animated pretty well. But, you know, it's it's the PC. So yeah, some true. people it looks fine. Some people, like, for, for a while, all of my facial models had, like, white dots on, like, the vertices. That you, like, was from an AUG before you lost it. Chicken pox. Oh, that makes a lot of sense then. And I you was can like, get where that do these back. dots come from? Yeah, so because he's like reading scanner? the face, huh? It's like a face scanner, like it was mapping the points on their face, so he yeah. could read yeah, it against you the can database. Get like a social Cassie, C A S S, -S, -S that, that allows you to like pick up on facial cues, and then you know you get it's, different dialogue options. It's based really off. cool because I picked that up pretty quickly because I'm yeah, all same. about like the options, and I really enjoy like when it, when it comes into use. Like it goes into first person, it like scans their face, a little thing pops on the side, it shows like. It'll quickly tell you, like, are they sweating? Are they not sweating? Their heartbeat? And then, like, what kind of personality they are as they continue to talk. It'll be like, they're more of a beta or an alpha or an, or an omega. And then certain what? special options. <laughs> That's not a thing, I don't think. Omega? It, uh, I don't know. It, it has it. But, and then, it, depending on how level that is, it'll give you special speech options that you can talk to them with to more appeal to their personality type. Like, that's cool. I like that a lot. Or you can just spec into muscle and guns and just kill everybody. I will, I will say, like, as I do want to play through the whole game. Hopefully we'll get a chance to do so on the subscriber stream at some point, but I think Adam Jensen might be just, like, the most boring character in the world. He was boring in Human Revolution. He's too. got... Here's yeah. his character traits. He never asked for this. He has cool sunglasses that would make you look like a fucking idiot in real life. <laughs> he's got a stupid beard, and that's it. And then apart from that, he's His just trench like, coat is pretty cool. He's got a long trench coat. That's it, yeah. Somebody said on Reddit that they should do a live action and get Keanu Reeves to play him. That would work I, really well. He looks like Keanu Reeves. I don't yeah. dispute that. But, like, Adam Jensen is so boring. He is a he's boring just, dude. He has no... I guess it's so that you can put yourself... You can define his moral compass. But at least all the dialogue that I've seen so far is like, you know, hey, uh, Adam, how do you feel about this terrible thing? Uh, I don't like it. I think we, <laughs> people should be good. And you're like, oh, whoa, that's a bold statement of <laughs> characterization. Sounds like somebody I know about video games. <laughs> <laughs> it's weird because it's a little hypocritical of me because I really like uh, Geralt from Witcher 3 and he's similar. Yeah. But it works for him, but it doesn't really work for Adam Jensen. I don't know why. It's, for it's me. a difference. Like, you know, there's, I think, a subtlety to it. One, like, you don't have to be super talkative or say a lot of things, right? That kind of creates more of a more contemplative character and stuff like that. But it really, what defines it is what you do choose to say when you, you say stuff, right? Yeah. So if you're, you're saying dumb shit. It's like, all right, well, <laughs> whatever. Uh, I, mechanically, like, as far as uh, shooting goes, it feels all right. Like, I'm not a huge... I prefer just to sneak around. Like, for the most part, I've gotten through most of my missions without shooting more than, like, two tranquilized shots and getting being yeah. able to get through, and the game does support that. Um, what's blown me away about the game so far, even more so than Human Revolution, is the insane amount of options per mission. And it's taken me a little while to train myself to think vertically, in this game and not just think what's in front of me and what are my options like for one one of the missions i could have uh gone into the sewer system and accessed the building through the sewer instead of going through like the front door or like a window or going onto the the roof and going that way like there are an incredible amount of ways to tackle each mission uh that that's really kind of the standout of this game it's really giving the player 
complete and, and utter control over each mission saying you do it how you want to and being able to um use some of your powers to give you more access like there's an ability that allow you to dash really quickly it's almost like a blink. Yeah, yeah. you can Acres use that dash. to get to, to places that are too high to jump to which will then open up new ways to complete each mission it's really cool and be able to like go up to a panel that has a code and be like all right i can hack this i can uh go look for the code on somebody uh i can look for like a pda that has the code on it and just say like that one little simple thing is like three different ways you can you can crack it open is neat i like it a lot yeah it's like you almost have to this is a very like hoity-toity way to explain it but i think you if you want to get the most out of it you have to actually have to have like some self-discipline because there are some times where i'm like i don't have the code for this um maybe i'll just shoot everybody in the head and then i gotta be like no <laughs> i obviously could i'm behind cover <laughs> poke out shoot them in the head no problem right but um yeah it's definitely it's it's more fun if you play it as almost like a detective game and then like i did i don't know have you done the palisades bank thing yet no, I have not. It's a side mission, I think. It's a side mission, at least. And you, basically, you go to a bank, and you have to get some dirt on the CEO. Okay. And I did the whole thing stealthily, like, go through the vents, you hack into somebody's office, you get a key card, you use that key card to go up in the elevator to the floor that you're not supposed to go to. And then at the end, there was just, like, one dude. And I was like, come on, man. <laughs> like, just look in the other direction for, like, two seconds, and he didn't. So I had to shoot him in the head with a trank rifle. I was like, if I run out of tranquilizers, this is a real problem. But don't so shoot. there is, there is a get out of jail free card. But uh, in the end, I think that it's actually very good. And I, I'm hesitating to think of like what else has come out in the recent past. I, I recognize we're sort of in the doldrums before like the holiday season. Yeah. But either way, what has, has come out in the recent past that is like as intriguing as this for me from a AAA standpoint? And I don't think there's much. So. Uh, I, I found myself even more positive than I think the critical reception has been so far. Can I ask about the setting? Because I found the setting in the last game to be a bit bland. Uh, not bad, but just like generic sci-fi and warehouses and factory kind of stuff. Is this uh, sort of along the same lines? I mean, it's, I mean, yeah, it's the same world. It takes place in daytime, so it's a lot more color than like the last one. It's very, very pretty. Uh -huh. Um... I think the theme and, like, the story going on is more interesting than the first one. Uh, the idea of, like, the events of the of the, f the first game have created the segregation between augmented people and, like, natural people. And that permeates, like, throughout the whole game, you'll get randomly stopped by cops to check your papers and stuff like right. that. Um, but, I mean, it's still very much like a cyber dystopian cyberpunk world with the same kind of architecture i guess yeah of the first one but i i think the setting is relatively generic honestly it just it feels yeah. like it's just it's city yeah is know? it still yeah, detroit it's... the previous one was detroit no is you're in prague a... in this one for the most yeah. part. so okay. far anyway the very first days x game the first setting you see is you're you're on the by the statue of liberty yeah and like that's actually really cool, and they've never really made a really recognizable place again yeah. that I can think of beyond that one time. It's always just kind of city and back alleys and grimy cyberpunk world. And you This know, time it's I, in the day, so you got a blue sky. Yeah, I, I do prefer daytime if you're going to go that route. It's a little bit more interesting, at least. I think it's like the I first like, Deus Ex game during the day. One thing I'm learning about stealth games, and maybe a reason that I was never good at them when I was younger, is I, like, overestimated how intelligent the AI is. I was going like, to bring that up. If these people acted like real people, Sam Fisher would get shot in the head in like two seconds, right? <laughs> yeah. There's, there's actually, <laughs> early on in Deus Ex, um, again, I don't know if it's a side mission, in, in Mankind Divided, just to be specific, um, there's a point where you have to go through a checkpoint, but it's being run by a corrupt cop, and you need to get like a new mm -hmm. permit. So the permit's going to cost you like way more money than you could conceivably have by that point of the game. So you got to sneak in in order to get it, or at least that's what I did. So the dude is like, hey, it's going to cost you like 1,200 credits. And I'm like, eh, fuck that. And I went behind him, or not even behind him, but in his field of view, Jumped. climbed on a van, yeah, and too. then got on like a first story ledge and just walked <laughs> right through his field of view until I was <laughs> behind him and then dropped behind him. And it was like entering restricted zone. Like, it's like, it's that whole job. idea. So the game, yeah, for those who don't know, the game has two like types of zones. There's like the normal zone on the mini map and then red zones that are considered restricted zones. 
as long as you're in an allowed zone, enemy AI won't really, they won't aggro you. But the yeah. minute you cross over into a restricted zone, that's when they get, like, aggressive. But it doesn't matter, like Ryan said, you can just jump up on the thing right in front of me, like, you're not gonna let me in? All right. Boing! <laughs> and you just jump up and then just walk over him and then you're in the restricted zone and he's just like, I don't know where he went. Yeah, just, like, like, if you were watching gone. this dude, like, the, the normal human field of vision has some brutality <laughs> associated with it. You'd be like, oh, oh uh, you're not gonna let me in? All right. And then he'd just be like, I see you. Yeah, say, oh, I see just... you. You're on the van. You're right in front of me. You're just six feet higher than you used to be. <sighs> but then, you know, you, you kind of have to, in your head, realize the the uh, limitations of the AI and work with that. Or if exploit you, the you, shit out of it. If you think about it too much, you're like, well, this is... This is the amount of times in this game, too, that there's been, like, a couple dudes patrolling with each other, and then I'll, I'll knock one out and drag him away, and the guy just keeps patrolling, and he's like, hey, he must have... <laughs> well, Bob's gone! Oh, well. And he just keeps moving around. Doesn't care. They like, really need to develop some proper middleware for enemy AI that so we can, like, move past, as an industry, this stage of, like, AI being just brain dead. Because it's so important to games people. like this to have these emergent moments, right? And you never get them. I think that's, like, intentional in a lot of ways, though. Yeah. I think they're trying to make it so it's not, like, they generally, we know how people behave and, like, what kind of stuff would actually set us off. And then, but would a lot of people really want to play that game where it's just so unrelentingly realistic? You'd, you'd never get past the first level. I like, think there's a happy medium that can be had, though. For for instance, I know other games have done it, but I can't think about it. Um, maybe it was Metal Gear. Um, being, like, fully seen by the enemy right and being completely caught and they're shooting at you but you get away and you hide long enough for the alarm to go back and they go back to normal they should stay at an alert stage there shouldn't be a timer that ticks down and be like all right they'll be done looking for you in uh 60 seconds or whatever which what yeah. is what happens in mankind divided there's a timer that ticks down you're like all right they leave me alone because that that pulls me out a little bit where like we were just having a firefight like there is somebody here after something clearly but after a minute you're like he must have left Back to my patrol, we'll bury Bob in the morning. <laughs> like, like that, I, like you're just having like, okay, somebody's here. Let's say on a guarded alert status where maybe the AI is a little bit more awake than it normally would be. That's cool. I do agree though that, yeah, they have to make certain concessions to give the player the power, uh, the power fantasy or the stealth fantasy that they want to have. Right, the cat showed up. <laughs> I agree with you. I agree with you. Like, I don't know. I, I think the current philosophy of designing stealth games relies on AI who, if you put them in the real world, would have, like, a single-digit IQ. Like, right. you think that can see, like, an a unconscious body and then be like, wow, that's weird. But still, like, mostly just go back to business as usual. Like, I think we are a little bit past, like, you see a pile of bodies and they go, oh, it must just be the wind, but not much. But... It requires, like, a different kind of design if you're going to have realistic AI that actually, like, irreversibly changes into, like, hostile mode that aggressively hunts you down and stuff like that. And I, I don't know. I kind of see it, like, almost like the physics in a platform game. Like, the, yeah. the AI is to some extent arbitrary. As long as the actual act of accomplishing the goal is satisfying, then there's value in it. Like... To be stealthy in that Palisades mission in human or in mankind uh, divided did require some trial and error, and like the, the AI was stupid, but they were still smart enough to find me on a couple of occasions. So, right. I, I don't think it necessarily takes too much away from the experience that the AI is not necessarily you know one to one realistic yeah. or, or even close well, to be honest. I guess I'm coming from the perspective of like this is a power fantasy, yeah, and that's the point. It's supposed to be. You're in an elevated position of ability over the things you're fighting against. But if you're fighting against things that are marginally brain dead, do you really feel like you need that power? You could be a normal person and still have an advantage just by having intellect. So, like, what's really, isn't it sort of taking away from the power fantasy of not letting you assert that you're actually at least at a base level of human competency? Do you know what I'm trying to say? I mean, no, yeah. yeah, I do. I know. I, I do know what you're trying to say. I guess, like, so far, like, we, we're making fun because AI can be really dumb I, for certain aspects, but they're not, like, completely, like, dead in yeah. the inside. They just do, like, being able to jump in front of a dude, like, all you had to do, for, in my opinion, to, to fix that small thing, being like, oh, you won't let me in or I'm just going to jump over you. Like, 
make the the jumping point around the corner of a building like yeah. that's where you start accessing it is like out of his sight on the building you can get up that way little things like that could just you know fix the idea of like all right i'm just gonna jump on your car in front of you and you're just not gonna stop me so whatever some of yeah. my favorite things about stealth games are like in the new hitman where you do something really weird in front of them and they're like what are you doing <laughs> like they call you out for it yeah and i love those little awkward moments of like they're calling you out for being in a video game and they're the ones in reality right right, right. i love that I want to see those emergent moments happen all the time because you do weird shit in video games that doesn't make any sense in reality. I, I Everyone like, just pretends it makes sense. Like you, like, <laughs> like you're in a when you go to your home base, like in front of everybody, like somebody gets up from their computer and you're like, I'm just gonna hack into their computer in front of like 13 people. Yeah. No one's gonna stop me. It's fine. It's still a great game though. I'm still really, really liking it. I loved Human Revolution and I'm really enjoying Mankind Divided. It's more Human Revolution with just more options and more toys to play with. So. You can check it out right now, 60 bucks on Steam, and uh, or check it out on the console, whatever you want to do. It's good stuff. And that will wrap up our topic section. We will be moving over now to everybody's favorite segment, Ask Roundtable. Today's question comes from Twitter because I didn't have access to the email. And the tweet uh, that we got was, I gotta find it, there, uh, there it is, it's coming from Ajak. Ajak asks... Do games have as much narrative value and substance as a novel or a play? What is your opinion on that? That, I'm going to throw right to Nick, right out the gate. <laughs> <laughs> All right. As much narrative substance as a novel or a play? Well, I think to say anything definitive would be to sort of negate the point of the medium, which is to say that every individual medium has its own strengths and weaknesses. None of them function in a vacuum. Um... I wouldn't say that games are intrinsically better than any other medium, but they do have their own unique delivery mechanism. And that added element of allowing you to roleplay as the character from a perspective that you may never have the accessibility to portray right. uh, does actually make it a meaningfully different experience. And there are situations like some of these narrative-based games that I've been playing, like Soma, The Beginner's Guide, inside. those sort of games inside, well, yeah, yeah, well, to some degree, yeah. where... It's, uh, it's just such a suspended reality that it totally lets you empathize in a new emotional way that you can't even relate to without the premise of being the person who's at the focus of this uh, thing that's built around you. Like, you're in space, and you're the single fixed point that space is reflecting upon, whereas in most of those other mediums, you're externally viewing into something else. And you could argue that, yeah, you're, you're viewing into something here too, but you're focused on something that's focused on you. Right, and that's right. sort of different yeah. than these other narratives most of the time. I mean, yeah, you can write a book from first-person perspective as well, but it doesn't happen that often, and granted, games don't have to take that approach either. But it is sort of something a bit unique about it, the interactive element, the way that it's dynamic, the way that it adapts to things that you may or may not do. Those are elements that are not contained in any other medium quite the same way, and I think that's what makes it meaningful, and I think it contains nearly infinite potential and in why I'm so excited about it as a medium in general and why I've chosen to spend so much time focused on it, because I personally think it's one of the coolest things that we've got going as a civilization, uh, the ability to go off into these realms and just have fun with it and see where it takes us. That, you might say it defines us as a civilization, you know, what makes us human. Video games? Yeah. Storytelling. You think so? Yeah. And food. Poutine, mostly, but food. <laughs> I, I agree. I think video games do have as much narrative value as novels or plays. And like, I mean, it's, I'm basically just going to echo what you said is that it's just a different type of narrative and the ability to, even with some games form that narrative is, is unique to this medium alone. Like you, I mean, I guess you had to choose your own adventure books, you know, kind of, but it's, it's a little different than like a movie or just a straightforward novel. And that alone makes it something that I am more likely to play. Like, I will gladly play a video game over going out to see a movie unless it's Deadpool matinee uh, than, than most other things. I mean, that so, was good, though, so... I mean, I fair. agree, yeah. It was, it was definitely, <laughs> definitely I, worth it. I think, uh, you know, there's validity and, and justification for all forms of storytelling because they're, you know, they can deliver the same story, but it's being represented... Uh, in a different way in each case you know a book you you have the words uh and you're able to kind of paint the picture and the tone a lot of the times in your head and it still offers uh 
uh, some some interpretation. You could have a simple painting, right? So you're looking at it and you can kind of interpret it even yeah. more. There are no words, so you really you're forming a lot of the story and what it means to you. Um, movies, I I really like movies mostly because I hate holding a book. Um, and and get a Kindle I can, man, <laughs> I can get up and and do other stuff, but it still it offers you know more of a direct like this is what the the uh, the director or the storyteller this is kind of what they mean by the story of course there can still be elements where they say like oh well, you know what happens at the end of the movie does this person really live or die or you know different things like that but and you can keep going on music does the same thing uh, yeah. or it, you know same thing in that it's different and same for video games you get to play it you get to choose your actions uh, within this this world, this story that's created. And I think it'll, you know, no form of storytelling is ever, as far as I could could assume, be become obsolete, right? They're not going to say, well, we're not going to do books anymore because video games are just so good at, at telling right. stories or we're yeah. not going to do movies anymore because of video games, so on and so forth. And I, I think they add, they add, they enrich. Um, Complement each other. Yeah. And uh, so, yeah, to say, like, it has more or less narrative uh, value is if anybody trying to really define that, that's, you know. Well, there are some ways, in fact, I would say a novel might even be superior in some formats. And what I mean by that is you're free to read into these lines of dialogue or the, the way that things are written and to come up with your own, using your own imagination, come up with your own little stories to fill in the blanks of things. And when you're literally looking at a video game, you get yeah. to see literally everything that exists in front of you. Yeah. Um, and one thing I kind of liked about retro games is that when they had really minimalistic pixel art that wasn't able to render things naturalistically, you had some of the same crossover there where you could fill in some of the blanks with your own ideas. And now we're at the point, though, where everything tries to be as naturalistic as possible most of the time. And you're kind of just, you, what you see is what you get. And yep. I do kind of like a little of both in a little of both. Just pull a Zack Snyder and have like a million dream sequences in which case <laughs> you don't know what reality is. Yeah. True. Ryan, anything to add? Yeah, I mean, I think that the problem right now is that, you know, it's it's really easy to look at games writing and be like, games writing is a cut below the way that it is in, in movies or novels or plays and, and TV especially right now. I think that's pretty fair. The difference is, like, I feel like a lot of AAA game writing is, like, let's take the plot of a movie and then make it 25 times longer. Yeah. <laughs> that fucking yeah, right. sucks. Yeah, so, yeah. Like, <laughs> Have you ever watched a movie and been like, that was, like, half an hour too long? Yeah. Well, yeah. how about do that, but, you know, 40 times longer? Like, it's, it's a little ridiculous. So I think it takes a special kind of talent to make something that's effective in that kind of, like, in that amount of time. Like... It, I guess it Sometimes is more like a they book. don't succeed. Yeah. I mean, The Witcher 3, from what I hear at least, is a really good example of a, a game that, like, continues its world building and lore throughout the entire game, even though it's super long. So that I, it's definitely the, the exception rather than the rule, though. And I think when games are at their worst, it's really when they're like, this is like a bad movie script, and yeah. then also cover-based shooting in between I, it. Uh, David Cage agree. games. I think Excuse it was me. an era that we went through of this romanticizing of the idea of games being movies. We yeah. thought that that was like the platonic ideal that games should aspire to be more like movies. The Order 1886. Probably couldn't have been much more wrong about that. Once oh, yeah. games find their own identity, that's where they succeed. And it's only in recent years now that we've really sort of taken on that mantle that that's even a oh, thing people sh want to aspire to do. Shit. All right, cool. We're back. Everybody's slightly darkened, but I don't know why. Stories suck. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know what happened there. That's annoying. All right, well, Nick, continue your point, or does that no, end? No, I'm, I'm good. All right, sorry, man. <laughs> <laughs> I just panic moment. All right, well, now it'll be a... Uh, thank you for the question, Ajax. If you want to send questions, send it over to roundtableyt at gmail.com. Next time uh, somebody has access to... Uh, the email, we'll, we'll pull them from there. Also, thank you to everybody who tweeted at me, especially people who tweeted at me, fuck math as question mark as the question. Very valuable. <laughs> Moving on. Oh, everybody's bright again. Beautiful. Uh, everybody's favorite section after everybody's favorite segment. It is Nick's Weird Games. And we got a suggestion from one of the tweets that we're going to use. And it is from Lou Johnson. 
he suggests Safety Dance as the song. I did give Ryan a nice heads up beforehand. Yeah, I didn't prepare for this one though, because I'm not as familiar with the with the safety dance. But it would be like, <clears throat> you do you have the game already, Nick? Oh yeah, we're ready. Okay, done. like uh, you could play if you want to. You can play a Nick's weird game, provided you have an emulator that might rhyme with Mame. <laughs> there you go. The game came out in Asia, <laughs> and it's from 2002. It was published by Koei, who then became Tecmo, and it got a 4.2. <laughs> Nick's Word Games. Nick's Word Games. Everybody pull out your dicks. <laughs> the end. <laughs> that... <laughs> good good, good ending there. Everybody pull out your dicks. All right, chat. Hide away. Let's do this. All right. Today we're doing a PC game for Nick's what? Word oh, Games. Oh, shit. What? Can you imagine a reality? <laughs> Where this is even possible. Not only is it a PC game, but it's a real-time tactics game. What does real-time tactics mean? Is what, this, isn't, this isn't the Nick that uh, I know. I'm con Nick, stop! This is too confusing. You're, you're blowing my mind, Nick. What? You're hoping it never sells. All right, so this game is from 1998. Okay. I want Ryan to get it, like, right now. <laughs> <laughs> Deus Ex Invisible War. <laughs> I think that was uh, 2002. Exists from 2004. Four. I just remember shooting the basketball in the the room you start in, and it bounced like that. It's like that's Overwatch. No. Right. Yep, that is Overwatch. You're correct. I'll shoot the it, basketball, and the Reaper goes die die. I'm gonna shoot your basketballs if you don't give us some clues. All right, you want some clues? Uh, developed by you may know these guys, Bungie. Oh, Published is it? Published by Bungie. Because of the M, right? What it, we've got. Oni or Ani? No, marathon? No. Marathon. Body, marathon. Body Harvest. Nope. It's not Marathon. Oh, shit. Oh, it was the original no, a, Halo. A tactics game. Yeah, I thought Marathon was. No, maybe I don't know. This is, is, it, a... is it Myth? Myth. Myth. Is it Myth 2? No. Colon. <laughs> Quest for Booty? So it's, it's a Myth, myth game. Three. It's Myth. It's Myth something. Myth 2. Mythbusters. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I was just hoping you'd give me the full name, but yeah, it's Myth 2. You got it. Good, Good myth, job. Myth Good Hunters. Job. Where is it here? Uh, myth. Just give me the Myth game. You got the big I box? A, I got a... No, it's not a big. It's Red just a and dead box. <laughs> Myth 2 Soul Blighter. Oh, yeah. The Bungie game that I'm actually quite a big fan of. I played a lot of this back in the day, and I think it's actually a fantastic game. And I'm not huge on strategy or tactics games, but this one did something for me for, I don't know, whatever reason. I think it's because there was no resource management. You just kind of get an army and you just go nuts with it. So it's more about tactical planning, sending people in certain places, certain times. Um, a little like the Total War games, actually, but with a fantasy sort of Warcrafty theme. That's um, cool. That's great game. If you haven't played it, I'd recommend check out Myth. The PC games, man. You're going to throw... That's how you're going to win this. You Easy, play it on got it. PlayStation Go. First... Oh, you know what Skype did? It readjusted my camera to 4x3. Yay. For the rest of you guys. I, I got two, two points. Zex Deeks has it. There may be one ahead of you, but you may be the one. Zex Deeks? Zex Deeks. Nice. Zex yeah, it's like you're, you're the winner today. Congratulations. Congrats, Zex Deeks. Thank you guys for uh, guessing. I don't know where I was going with that one, but... Uh, that's going to wrap it up. Thank you guys for joining us for today's Roundtable Live. We almost made it through Tech Free. Uh, next week, there may be one. It'll be me and Nick that are that are staying here so if we can round up enough people and uh, we can get another one going. Otherwise, uh, everybody else is going to be at PAX West enjoying themselves. <laughs> uh, thanks to all our Patreon supporters, whoever you are. I don't have the name list in front of us, but thank you. It actually means a lot. You guys allow us to do what we do. We appreciate it a great deal. And uh, go check us out on iTunes. Rate us five stars. Head up to our Reddit thread. Reddit.com slash r slash roundtable pod. There's got to be a better way of doing that. But <laughs> check that out. Our Twitter. Follow us on Twitter for all kinds of good stuff. And yeah, Bear's in chat and he's linking stuff. So go check those out. Thank you guys so much for watching. And we'll see you next time. Oh. Bye. Bye, everybody. <laughs>